Welcome to CSIS. Thank you for coming this morning, and thank you for those watching us online. Today's topic is one that's really close to my heart, accelerating federal movement to the cloud, federal government use of cloud services, something where we could do a little better, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Cloud is um, central to IT modernization and to cybersecurity, as you probably saw in the national cyber strategy. Um, but federal government cloud use is not where it should be. Right? And that's nobody's fault, it's just the nature of the beast. And so we're gonna to talk today about how do we maybe pick up the pace a little bit. We're really lucky in that we have a great panel. Um, nothing I did, so let me start with uh, Fred Humphreys is Corporate Vice President of Government Affairs for Microsoft Corporation here in Washington. Jason Kelly, could you, that's a hard one, isn't it? Yeah. Jason Kelly is the Managing Partner and General Manager of Global Strategic Partnerships and leads IBM's Global Blockchain Services. You can tell us about that if we have time. Scott Jordan is Vice President of Federal Civilian Cloud Sales at Oracle. And Ala Good Goldman Seifert is Senior Manager and leads Public Sector Public Policy. Wow, that's a lot at Amazon Web Services. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We will have a little time uh, on the at the end for questions from the audience. There might be a button on the website that lets you submit questions. Uh, if there is, uh, go ahead and do that. We'll try and get them read. We won't have that much time. We've got about an hour, so thank you. Let me start with some questions for people. And uh, let's do a little base uh, baselining to start with. Um, how does the government use of cloud compare to the big enterprises in the private sector? I don't know who wants to start, Jason, and we can just go down the row. So we can, when you say compared, it's very interesting to, to think that there's a real difference. Um, we look at the, the, the bright, shiny thing in the room right now, Gen AI. And Gen AI is just AI and another flavor, another part of AI as a whole. And we can call it many different things, but at the base of all of this is data. Data is at the core. And so when we think that, that commercial enterprise business uses data differently than the government, at its core, it doesn't. It's how do we take many different capabilities around many multiple sets of data with trust, with security, with transparency, and get it to work together. That's, that's the similarity. And so people want to know the difference. There are some differences, of course, because we're talking national security, which is at the very heart of all of this. And we hear that, we heard it with, with, uh, with Senator Schumer yesterday on one of the stages right here, is that we have to have some level of, of governance and understanding around that security because we start to open up many questions. The answers are all in how we all work together. And I'll do it up front, and some of the people have seen my shtick before, because as Jim said, I'm with IBM, right? Uh, and, I, and, and, and yes, I'm, I am blazing with the IBM logo here. However, and this is where the crowd will see it, inside, I bleed the other colors of our teams. So every logo that I work with, and I pull the other, if it wouldn't mess up the mic, I've got another a big heavy jacket to carry with all these lapel pins. But on a serious side, that's the answer because each one of these lapel pins so have their own platform that has to work together because we hold different data sets. So that's what's the same. It's not what's different. What's the same is that all of us are ready to work together. And part of what we'll talk about is, so how do we do that? How do we get government to work the way that enterprise works? Which is, and this is the challenge, in a collaborative way, in an open way technology open platform way. That's, that's the difference, I think, that I'd, I'd call out, Jim. That's great. Ella? Sure. Um, I'll take a little different stance, and that's sort of like the quintessential existential difference between selling to the government um, or the government adopting a technology versus private industry. And that is the government receives funding from the legislature, from the taxpayers, to do, to do its mission. And there are requirements around competition methodologies, federal acquisition regulations, defense federal acquisition regulations, supplemental regs, right? Like the, uh, the amount of 
regulation associated with just a procurement, just the mechanics of an adoption of a technology in the federal government are really significant. And that's just for uh, the, the part that involves the buying of the thing. Then there's the accrediting of the thing. Uh, there's a law, FISMA, that places the authority for approving software on a federal CIO. So that's another stakeholder. So you need, you need money from the legislature, you need, uh, you need a procurement official to do the thing, to do the competition, and then on top of that, you've got, a, you've got the security uh, stakeholders. And so that's a lot of folks that are in the loop in making a technical decision. So you wanna do great data work, you wanna get amazing mission outcomes, you wanna modernize, but there's a lot of folks in government that must be brought along, that must be bought in to, in our case, a new way of doing business, a new way of procurement, procurement, a new way of, um, of delivering solutions. And um, I would say that that is one of the most kind of existential issues associated with, uh, with the public sector's adoption and technology. And specifically moving to cloud is folks want to modernize, but oftentimes it takes such a long time to get the correct set of stakeholders fully bought in in the time frames that you have. When, when legislature gives you money, you've got to spend that money and you've got a ticking clock, and um, sometimes it takes much longer to carry out the process uh, to even procure the tech before you can even get hands-on keyboards coding to build the really great solutions where you're really meaningfully using the data. So that's a, it's a quirk of public sector. Yeah, I think Jason and Al made some great points. I, I would say that the, you know, the acquisition uh, model in government is obviously one of the differences between um, public and private sector. Um, and I think some of the public-private partnerships that, that Jason touched on around critical infrastructure protection, um, Department of Energy working with industry partners, Department of Health and Human Services working with industry partners, um, and, and kind of sharing those best practices is really important. And I think, you know, regardless of public or private sector, um, enterprises have different levels of cloud adoption and, and cloud maturity. Um, some government agencies are, are more mature than, than commercial counterparts and, and vice versa. And so I think um, understanding, sharing, and leveraging best practices um, across sectors is, is, is really important. Um, and just one of the things that, that I've seen in terms of the difference between commercial uh, enterprises and public sector enterprises is the use of um, cloud centers of excellence. So I think that's a model that's very mature on the commercial side, commercial uh, enterprises that uh, you know, have a high degree of cloud adoption and cloud maturity typically have a strong um, cloud center of excellence. So that's one best practice, I think, um, that could be leveraged uh, in the public sector more effectively. Well, I get to go after, uh, first of all, three great companies, um, and they've really captured well <laughs> Uh, the differences, I guess what I would just maybe just uh, double down on is, is um, the process. Uh, the acquisition process um, for um, the government needs to be modernized. It needs to move faster um, and brought along. And, you know, frankly, there's a lot of money already spent when it comes to uh, I, you know, the IT budgets are there, um, um, could use a little bit more, um, but uh, most importantly, uh, what it takes to, to be issued a contract is just, you know, frankly, I'm just kind of want to be out there and not safe online and whoever's there, it needs to move a whole lot faster, a whole lot faster. The government uh, could do much better in moving faster. Um, to the to the cloud in, in particular, and um, if not, you, I think you know you're putting yourself at, at risk in some ways on uh, you know the cybersecurity threats and things of that nature are real. You know, very very real, and and, and it's not going to subside. That's just one one aspect. Um, I also just want to just make a point that Jason uh, uh, um, t uh, talked about as far as that. Uh, the importance of uh, government, how they think about it, right? Is that all of these companies can work together and this opportunity, competition is alive and well, right? And, and if done right and strategically, uh, um, you can maximize um, when it comes to you know, moving to the cloud uh, with any one of these companies to still be able to do different things together that's in the best interest of this country. Great. You, um 
touched on the question I'm going to ask last, which is, last, which is what is the role of Congress? But let's save that for the end, because it's the drama part, and you know it so well. Uh, <laughs> I hate drama, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a plan. What is the role of Congress? <laughs> it, it sounds like a Netflix movie, right? What is the role of Congress? Yeah. Um, so well, maybe part of this, though, in uh, thinking still internally uh, in, within the administration, how should we drive change? And some of this gets to acquisition reform, but is this something that agencies can do on their own? Is it the CIO Council? Is it, is it OMB? Is it uh, GSA, which you're familiar with, of course? Um, how do we... How do we assign responsibility for driving change here in the federal government? Jason, you first. Who do you okay. talk to regularly? So I, I would uh, take the question, we have to talk about you know, business process, and I think Fred was on a, a, a key point here, because when we typically talk modernization, or we hear someone say modernization, the, the techies and the technology should think, oh, I must be talking app modernization. I must be talking infrastructure. No, it's business process modernization. So that's where I, I think we have an opportunity to start. I think that's where the focus should be. Instead of talking the old system where it's, I'm going to acquire this product or that product and, and put it, pit them against it, let's go from product to productivity. Let's talk about understanding what's the outcome that we're getting to. Because if you focus on the outcome, then you're going to say, oh, wait, wait a second. There's not one product or one company that can solve this very complicated problem that isn't a GSA problem. It's not a DOD problem. It's a government problem because they have to talk to each other. And that's the, 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 the effort and the focus that should be, should be driven here is that we want to talk modernization of business process. And then on our side, we must come together to put teams that are focused on being dynamic and you can, you know, buzzwords like agile and can run sprints and do things in phases. And as soon as I say phases, then I do go back to the, oh, but budgets don't run like that. So again, it's a circular conversation that comes back to modernization of the business process. Yeah, I want to jump in. I know you're trying to go order and list, but I'm going to no. jump. I'm going to mix it up, Jim. Right. Sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, um, once again, I think Jason's just, just spot on if you look at outcome. But what you want to want to have, I mean, just the different processes, if it's what I call the three-letter agency versus the civilian aspect, there's just all these different processes. And there's things that give rise to that, because there's, there's, there's different aspects when you're thinking of national security, it, it, uh, uh, and particularly on the cloud and, and, and things of that nature. But if you can just work to harmonize, right, um, the, the, the processes in, in, in a manner of that, that um, you know, I hate to say, you know, create jobs for a whole bunch of lawyers uh, um, on just like, you know, procurement law. Sorry for any of the procurement lawyers that are in the room, but like, you know, that is not the most efficient way to be able to try to go uh, win something if he, if he can help to, to figure that out and just on these rules and regulations. And then some of them you need for accountability and things of that nature. But you can't get to the outcome piece if it's just like every department, every agency um, has its own quirk uh, um, and unique, unique aspects. And, and that's, that's almost what just, you know, we're, we're not good at doing sometimes. Uh, and I used to work in government, but just not good at doing sometimes. Kind of an overhaul um, to simplify um, and still strike the right balance of, of what you need. And then it can be applied across the board. But there's still going to be some things that you have to do because of you know, I want to overuse the word national security aspect, but to get to the outcome, that's to what uh, you were raising earlier um, on the difference between the commercial and government piece is, you know, you dealing with the commercial side, they want to they wanna do a deal, they'll figure it out. And they're going to focus on outcome. Then they're going to focus on, okay, this is what I need, suite of things that I need to go do that. And it's usually like, oh, you know, I, I got to get my, metal, you know, my little pins and my jacket, but it's a bunch of partners. Um, that's, right. that's a part of it. And that's a win-win. That doesn't work as well as it should. You know, and I think there, that is a goal of the government. I will, I will say, but boy, got to move faster. And I, uh, piggybacking off of that, I'll give a really tangible example that's native to, to sort of this part of the, the government IT ecosystem, and that's FedRAMP. 
So FedRAMP is a process. It was uh, created in 2011 after the, uh, the, the Cloud First strategy was released by the White House. And the idea was, all right, instead of having every single CIO do every single security assessment of every single cloud service provider separately, how about we have a program office at the GSA vet every CSP th with a third party auditor against a set of NIST controls, standardized set of security controls, let's go ahead, let's make everyone jump through these hoops. Yes, it's gonna be a little bit of pain, but the idea is you do it once and it's reused many times. The idea is, to give some confidence to individual chief information officers uh, and CISOs across agencies that this is what, th this is sort of uh, the gold standard, if you will, of, of security and compliance. Um, keeping in mind that we all invest billions in IT security uh, all over the globe, all the time. This is table stakes in our industry. We at Amazon say security is job zero. It's extremely important. But nevertheless, the government wants to see proof. And so this program was created back in 2011 uh, to, to sort of create this baseline. Well, what's happened is I, I, it is not as reused as we would like. And so what's been really wonderful, you asked about the role of Congress. Congress did um, codify the program into law back in, back in December of 2022. So that's wonderful to make sure the program is there, it's there to stay. Um, does it, does it need more money to increase throughput? Uh, does, it, does it need to be stronger in order to be a little bit more automated, to be more repeatable? So that the idea of use once, reuse many times, uh, Fred was just saying, like, how do we increase velocity? Um, how is it that we help folks that want to move, that want the mission outcomes to move faster? And a lot of the times the security uh, and the accreditation stuff is, um, it's friction. I, it's like procurement. It's it just it's added friction in the system, and um, I think this is a program that we've seen a lot of success. Um, I think it's been really wonderful. I think we can all say we've invested a tremendous amount of money into being compliant with the program and wanting to see it grow, wanting to see it evolve, so that we the entire ecosystem can have more approvals and that it's continued to be trusted by more folks. So there's less rework at the individual agency level. I don't know about roles and responsibilities. I think they're, you know, those are fairly well uh, defined in, in um, the federal market. And I think we have CIO councils and other councils that foster uh, cross-group collaboration. I think a big, uh, you know, one of the big things is creating a culture of innovation and that takes leadership. And so, you know, our companies um, drive innovation through our technology products. And um, we've had, uh, you know, I've personally been involved in kind of sharing what that culture of innovation looks like with customers to help them um, think differently about, you know, the, how they roll out technology, how they modernize processes like FedRAMP and, and things like that. Um, and then the other thing I would just say is that there is a lot of opportunity to um, work together on shared services. There's mission critical systems that are, you know, back office things that run HR and, and financials and things like that. And then, um, you know, there's um, you, you know, critical mission systems, which are the core mission applications that run the aviation systems or, or, or whatever, right? And the, the core, you know, the back office systems um, should be packaged applications that can potentially be leveraged in a shared services model, HR Connect. Um, at Treasury is a good example. They've got an HR application that's shared across 27 uh, or so different agencies. I think there's uh, definitely opportunity to, you know, try to create that culture of innovation and then foster that collaboration uh, across agencies um, to leverage existing investments um, and not reinvent the wheel every time you need a new solution. So, Maybe picking up on that, uh, one of the issues that's come up in talking to agencies, and it'll be interesting to see what you all have heard, um, how should agencies decide what can, they can safely move to the cloud? I mean, because there's always a little reluctance. Some of it's security, but there's more than that, and particularly for the civilian agencies. What would you advise them when you think about what you can move in terms of services or data? What should they be thinking about for moving to the cloud? I don't know who wants to go first. So we're not doing yeah, yeah, alphabetical we'll, we'll, we'll order. Switch anymore. it on. <laughs> go ahead. I'm, I'm just a policy gal. Well, I, <laughs> go ahead. So, yeah, I'm going to use that opportunity of our of our pause to, to make a point on your question. First thing is I'm going to be uh, uh, repetitive here is to change how they think about it. And I'm living Scott's comment about culture. And it's 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 first let's start with the culture piece, and then I'll get into you know where the, the process that I think they, they should be thinking about. The culture starts with 
not keeping score on how many things I'm moving, mm -hmm. but the outcome that I'm getting and I'm looking for in moving, because then that starts to change the process of what you're thinking about. But this thought of change, the culture, it sounds touchy-filly to most, but it's at the heart of everything. As soon as you say that, people will cross their arms, and usually when they do that, um, I tell them, hey, try and cross your arms the other way. And I go, yeah, change is, is, is a hell of a thing. You can't, it doesn't feel comfortable. I say, that's right, that's part of change. Either that or you know, move, move your furniture around in your living room and see how fast you can get through it in the dark. You know, those are some scary feelings and that's what is happening in this culture. You know, instead of a, you start the conversations, it's a yes, but this, yes, but change it to a yes and we can, and it starts, so these little small points of change are big points of change. So for, that's the start, the culture. So I'm doubling down on the, on the culture change. And then, as I said, this thought of keeping score on what we focus on when we talk about moving things to the cloud. The word migration just makes me uh, shiver. It's, you, there's not this thought of my, just migrating because when you modernize, it's, there's, a, there's a selection process. What makes sense for what I want? And just because something moves to the cloud doesn't mean that it doesn't move back on-prem based on the maturation and need of the enterprise. You would say, oh, but it's very complicated. Damn right it is. That's why you have people sitting here with, with thousands of people behind them that, that can make it happen quicker, better, faster. So I think part of that change has to, to kick in. And it, it's as, as simple for any of the techies in the room. When you start to think differently, it, it's, it's not that complicated when you say, oh, wait a second. We have, we have a capability where the, the front end, where Fred's front end uh, services are sitting with in, in Azure and everything is, is, is out there. You know, it can actually tie into an Oracle database now. It can call, or oh my goodness, did we just say that? Microsoft can call an Oracle database and we can have an on-prem, off-prem capability that's open using Red Hat and IBM. Oh, three, oh, that, that triumphant? They have to play. Yes, it's that simple. So I think isn't that, that a beautiful thing? It, it is. I mean, we, we want to hold hands <laughs> and sing "Kumbaya." No, up no, here. but uh, but I'm uh, I'm half joking. I'm yep. being serious. It's right. Just, just of being able to maximize right that and and figure out what's your outcome and then different services and things that you want uh, that that you as a customer government gets to choose. You know. Do you think about that when you think about your processes yes. <laughs> and, 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 and that aspect? That's what commercial business will do right. every, every, every day. It's not because, it's not because, and this is, a, Fred's mm -hmm. making a hell of a point here, because it's not, we didn't decide to work together because we decided we wanted to give up <laughs> extra profits. Oh, no, we can beat like hell. <laughs> we, yeah. but, what we, but the market, the market made us do this. And this is the difference Bingo. between government yes, and commercial is that the market, the commercial market said, you damn well better make it work or I'll find something that does. That's, it, and it forced exactly us right. to do this. So now we're saying, come on, catch up, government. But that's a hard problem. I'm going to interrupt here for a second because I was thinking about it this morning. The incentives in the private sector for the customers are they want the best service so they can be the most efficient, make the most money, be profitable. Government, not saying it's better or worse, government doesn't have the same incentives. They don't have a so, incentive for efficiency? Well, so I, I will say. <laughs> Apparently not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to jump in here a bit, I, I will say this administration and this White House, through their customer experience executive order, through the push toward zero trust adoption That's out true. of OMB, they are providing some of That's that top-down, mm. the, the That's realigning That's of true. incentives. Now, is that going to fix the culture? Is that going to fix risk acceptance? Not necessarily, but it might chip away enough so that sure. folks who want to move feel point. as though they have the top-down mandate from the White House, from OMB, from the Federal CIO's Council to, to chip away um, at, I think, the bureaucratic cruft maybe that Fred was talking about earlier to try, to try and, and do things a different way, which I do think will, will yield better culture. To Scott's point earlier, the, the top-down leadership to sort of focus folks toward outcomes is really essential to getting results. So you're spot on. There's, it's important, yeah, okay, so you have the top down, but you know, 
I always, uh, I think many leaders uh, realize that it's like, it's, it's great to, uh, you know, here's my edict and I've pronounced it, we're going to go do X. How do you get the buy-in? Because you need, you need both bottoms up too mm -hmm. and the top down. And that's when usually when you can see some movement. That's right. And there's, and there's got to be this kind of acceptance and then this, you know, almost like spirit. We can go do, we can do this, let's, let's go. You know, just just uh, aspect, and you actually will see that in some different agencies and departments where you can just see, like, okay, this one, this uh, this this department um, just knows how to. Uh, mm -hmm. They fly in formation, and they know that go how to know how to go and execute and implement and try to just maximize. Quite frankly, kind of you know, uh, know how to move through the system um, faster, but it still just moves so slow. And as, and you know, everybody always hears this from tech companies, but like things are picking up and particularly, you know, not here to digress from what we're here to talk about, but the whole Gen AI, you know, piece, you talk about something that's going to even move, you know, government's going to have to really think through that. And even though they're using more AI than they think they are, <laughs> it's, it's still the tip of the iceberg of just, of, of that aspect because Data centers in the cloud is a part of a part of that uh, um, 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 aspect. Senator Schumer said yesterday. I thought it was interesting that on that note, that he felt like the briefing he got two weeks ago might right. be out of date by now. Yeah. So the pace really is different. But uh, well, I think that's the important point is that there's not an easy answer, or we wouldn't be here. Um, yeah. And there's still yeah, mainframes that are being used, um, you know, from 60 years ago, right? So I think that's not fair. It's only 51 okay. years. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. But um, you know, I think the pace of innovation you know, in that time period has accelerated, especially recently. Um, and when you add, you know, AI and generative AI into the mix, um, that's going to accelerate even faster, probably than you know, the move from mainframe to distributed to internet to cloud. Um, so we're at a point where it is really imperative from, um, you know, a national security perspective. And, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, when you're a cloud provider, uh, sometimes everything, you're like a hammer and everything looks like a nail. Um, we think everything should go to the cloud. But I do think that, um, you know, the market is driving us towards, you um, open clouds where we do collaborate more with each other. That's good for customers um, and ultimately it will be good for business. We'll still compete, but that competition drives the innovation um, that the customer needs and, and, and deserves. And so, um, you know, I think in addition to kind of the market demanding it, we, we've seen more market demand on the commercial side um, in, in the public sector, that demand is, is there. And so you have some multi-cloud solutions in place to enable that, you know, connective tissue that, that needs to be there. But I think, you know, back to kind of the policy side of things, I, I do think that the executive orders um, and, and the national cybersecurity strategy are, yeah. are really good. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that, um, you know, in my opinion, we need to go a little bit further with some mandates around interoperability and open data and things like that to um, give the customer what they need um, and accelerate kind of the collaboration between all the major technology providers. So I'm not the moderator, but what do you think the holdup is on that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, Jim's I, never going to let me on another panel. Feel, it's like, hey, feel yeah, free to ask any questions. <laughs> we, don't, we don't need to have order. Go ahead. a preview. <laughs> I was. I'll, I'll try to land the plane literally on this thought of modernization because Scott just said something that's key because he 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 mentioned you know things that have been there and, and this thought of modern modernizing doesn't mean rip and replace because mm -hmm. there are frameworks and infrastructures things that, that are that are good there's investments that we need to capitalize on and the reason why I use the, the the land to plane part my my reference will be a, a an aircraft I was an airborne ranger I jumped out of airplanes my favorite planes a c-130 that's a cargo plane the c-130 platform has been around for 50 plus years that's an, a prop plane but it does the job. But guess what? It's an open platform. You can retrofit it with all our modern gun systems and make it an attack. I mean, if you can imagine an, an attack cargo plane, you can do that for black ops, for all these things that you can. But it's a, it's a reliable platform. So what do we do? We modernized it because it's an open platform. So now you get to land the plane kind of thought. Is it, why can't we have an open platform type of thinking? Because the government got that right. We can get this right. 
and it's just the same because that airplane, we call it cargo, but it carries precious cargo. It, 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 it helps connect different points, no different than we do with technology. That's what we should be but, thinking about. But you're right, but this, uh, I'll call it more on the process side, right? Mm -hmm. There's just not a lot of latitude sometimes on why, being why able to back rules, laws, <laughs> culture, <laughs> all, all the above. above. Yeah. <laughs> but rules. Yeah. Just you know, I mean, and and it's um, you know, the different processes and the different rules and regs and different aspects are just really complicated and. Sometimes they can uh, uh, they handcuff <laughs> some things that you may be able to go you know go do, and then at the same time, I mean, um, uh, not to get in the weeds, but then it's just like you know, then someone actually I'll call it a risk, and it maybe not be a risk because it's a, it's a it's a good idea they go do, and then you know there's protests, there's this or that. I mean, you you know, there's so many things that you can do. And all of us are guilty of doing it. Um, 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 aspect uh, um, that you know, it's five years later. Then it's then it's outdated <laughs> yeah. on that aspect. And so we've got to figure that out. And there's checks and balances. So I want to be very careful. There are checks and balances that are needed. Okay, that that, that that's that's good. what's the right checks and balances, right? What's the right way to do these things? They can be refined. And some places they need, we need to preserve, because now I don't want to make it seem like all the rules and regulations are bad. No, they, they, they have good intent and, 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 and many times have the right outcomes as a result of the rule that they're trying, what they're trying to achieve. Let me drag, I have two more questions. God knows if I'll get to them. But, and then we have, we have a bunch of questions from the audience, which we will get to. But let me touch back on the security theme a little bit. We had Rob Joyce here a couple months ago. And he started his talk by Rob Joyce from NSA. Yeah, yeah. He started his talk by saying, cloud is the future of computing. That was his opening line. And I thought that was really great. But you see this reflected in the national cybersecurity strategy, a lot of emphasis on cloud. How did the strategy change the landscape, change the environment for what you guys do in being cloud service providers? Or it did, I'm, I'm assuming it did. But. So um, I can start in sort of going off of a prior theme of the White mm. House giving folks top cover to adopt the things that everyone knows are good security, right? We offer, we all offer a tremendous amount of, of security tooling and to the extent that there are folks that feel as though if they can go in the data center and hug, hug a server, that that, that, that means security, um, then <clears throat> I think the both the uh, executive order on increasing the nation's cybersecurity posture from 2021 in the nation's or the, in the cyber strategy, have really emphasized the role of cloud as as a platform mm -hmm. for security mm -hmm. for a lot of government. Um, no matter what your mission is, are you um, are you distributing uh, part of the social safety net, mm -hmm. or are you uh, gathering weather data? You mm -hmm. need a certain level of security. Uh, mm -hmm on all parts of the tech stack and we, we certainly offer it and we certainly, um, I know we talked about partners earlier, but like to give another shout out to all of our partner networks, um, there, there are certain things that we sell and there are certain things that partners sell on top of us and it really oxygenates the marketplace. It yeah, is extremely true. competitive. That's there are true. best in breed solutions that are sold on top of our platforms that, that government buys um, already that they're gonna be buying more of. When I think about zero trust, I think that's a specific place um, where we're gonna see a lot of continued growth and a lot of additional adoption. Yeah, I think you're spot on on that. I agree, and I, I think that this, uh, you, you said something that sparked this thought of uh, you know, the multiple players that, that come together and the infrastructure that's there. That's, I, th I don't think the, this thought of cloud is, it's not new. <laughs> it's, it, it's far from new. And, and, and the, the changing infrastructure, it sounds so dramatic. You know, <laughs> IBM now 112 plus years old, if we count months. And when we landed people on the moon, leading the world uh, as, a, as, a, as a country and brought them home safely, behind that were IBM servers. There's X-Series now uh, that has, has gone out to other, other uh, owners, so that evolves. So there's an evolution. 
and we still have the, the this wonderful, it's, it is a shameless IBM commercial at this point, just for disclosure. <laughs> but I'm, I'm gonna get to the point that, that, and that's why I mentioned X, because that's another provider. But then you have Z, and if you, so we have these wonderful Z services that, that all the major banks around the world use IBM servers. So what? Guess what? They're also moving to the cloud. So does that mean that we're competing against ourselves? In a sense, it means that we're evolving. That's why I started with 112 years old. That's the only way you stay around, is that you have to reinvent. And this is what I said earlier with regards to the market demanding it. It's time for us to look at government and say, let's, let's, let's think through, you asked this con con congressional question, you know, Congress, let's look at our constituents just like we look at our shareholders. Our shareholders make bets on us because we respond faster than others to the market. Well, that's what we must do. We're a resilient country. We're the best damn dysfunctional, sometimes imperfect country on the face of this planet. So <laughs> with that, let's, let's speed up. As Fred said, let's, let's speed up. I'm a veteran. I'm proud of it because we are that country, and I expect more. And that's what we have to live up to. By the way, I just want to support you in your commercial. <laughs> IBM's one hell of a company, and you think about it on a serious note of the tech companies, because a lot of times... You hear about tech company, and 15 years later, they didn't keep up, right? Didn't modernize, didn't the next iteration. And you think about it in the tech industry, 112 years, that is, that's, that's damn impressive. Fred has clearly seen my coffee cup collection of, uh, <laughs> No, no, I'm so serious, because you'd be like, wait, what, what, that, what happened to that company? Uh, Palm Pilot. Yeah. I'm not here to do shout outs to the people who are now deceased. <laughs> but, but I just, just, no, no, seriously, you just think that's hard to do. Yeah, it and is. it's getting harder. So we so, did get a lot of questions. Let me try and get through them here. They're all good. So uh, thank you to the people who sent them in. Um, I'll start with this one. What are the additional challenges to accelerating adoption of the joint warfighting cloud capability? If you guys thought, do you want to answer this one? The joint warfighting cloud capability task orders that may be unique to the national security space. Anyone want to touch that one? Thought we can come back to it. Pass. Okay. <laughs> All right. Be that way. Sure, sure. I, I, the only what I I'll, quickly is I think that JWCC had brought some wonderful thoughts around a contract that points at multiple providers. Yeah. So it's headed in the right direction. So that's the positive that I would, and I say then. Be the, good to move with speed. That's, and so now the challenge is, uh, you know, how do we get the process to fit the intent? Yeah, I agree with you on that, actually. So next one. Um, how can existing authorities be used, such as uh, TMF or the IT Working Capital Funds? And that's a good question I'd like to know the answer to as well. Anyone want to touch I can it? take it, yeah. Um, as the procurement nerd on the panel, I feel like this is like my, this is my jam. Uh, so uh, in, in March of 2021, uh, the General Services Administration's uh, Technology Modernization Fund Fund, which had only gotten like 50, 25 million batches of funds at a time, received a billion dollars to give away. Uh, and what this administration has done uh, in light of its executive orders, in light of the mandates for zero trust, is they've also created additional flexibilities with respect to repayment. This fund uh, the idea, and I think initially, uh, was like, let's create a VC fund for IT modernization. Well, but then it's like, well, do they have to pay back the money? What if it's a risk? How big of a risk are we comfortable taking? What if, um, what if we recover all our costs? What if we recover none of the costs? What if it's somewhere in between? And uh, I think that program office has been trying to do a really good job with giving the money out in batches to different programs uh, and to different parts of the government um, who apply. Now, I think one of the challenges we've seen right back to process and culture is it takes a lot of gumption to go hat in hand. If you're a CIO or a CFO uh, of an agency that receives a fair amount of maybe appropriated dollars to go and ask for net new cash for a net new program. And I think uh, we've seen some friction in the process. We've seen, um, I think, some, some challenges around folks, a lot of interest in the money, but then the proposals themselves not being at the caliber, I think, that uh, that perhaps folks want. And so I think it's been a really exciting experiment. I think 
we collectively and our companies have been really engaged in trying to make sure that this process uh, is as efficient as it can be and that it yields the best results for, um, for, for agencies and helps them on their modernization journey. And I think th there's a lot more to do in terms of continuing to modernize it, continuing to make sure the money is spent well um, in that Congress, industry, the taxpayers see the results from that. Because the idea for giving it a billion dollars right off the bat was let's have it go fast. If there's an emergency, there's COVID, let's supercharge the TMF. And I think you know there's been a more of a trickle than a flood there um, in terms of that. So, and, and I know Fred wants to say something, I'll, I'll just add one oh. more thing. Oh. One of the, um, so uh, the TMF is just one funding source. One of the great things about the Modernizing Government Technology Act, which I wanna say was signed into law in 2017, like maybe January of 17 or fall of 16. Was it January 6 or 7? Oh. No. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, uh, is, uh, you know this stuff. This stuff. I'm just messing with you. Um, is uh, that working capital funds were created at a lot of agencies specifically for IT. And one of the, uh, one of the new authorities that were given by, by the legislation was to help agencies to the extent that they had some unused funds to be able to move or to be able to turn one year appropriated funds into three year appropriated funds just for IT. And I think we in the, in the, uh, in the government IT space were so excited. Well, one thing led to another and it turns out that the legislation didn't actually grant the requisite transfer authority for them to put the money in the fund. It created the fund that turned one year into three money, but no one could move money in without additional congressional action. So it's just one of these things where some agencies, they, they went through the process, they got the transfer authority, and now they're using them and it's going great. But I think uh, for others, the, the promise really exceeded what was uh, what was accomplished. That's a great example though of just like the promise piece. I mean that's like heading in the in the right direction that should be applauded but still. Yeah I think TMF is one of those ideas that the, everyone likes the theory but somehow it's been hard to right. get it to work and the right. multi-year funding uh, remains a problem. And right. You can have a little sympathy for Congress as they don't want to they don't want their, get their hands off the steering wheel sometimes. Uh, next question, how can government shared services accelerate cloud adoption? I don't know, Scott, do you want to do that one first? Yeah, I mean, I touched on that a little bit with uh, HR Connect, and there's some other shared services out there. I think, you know, fundamentally, a lot of it gets back to process that we've been talking about. I, you know, TMF and working capital are, are good ideas, but the implementation is challenged. And I think, you know, um, whether government agencies have enough funding or not to implement technology, I think one of the things um, that, that the funding should be directed at is, is figuring out how to implement artificial intelligence because fundamentally AI is all about automation, right? And if you can automate things, um, you, you, you can realize the value of the cloud, which is agility, speed, um, doing more with less. And, and so I think the more things that can be automated and then hopefully leveraged uh, across agencies, procurement is ripe for artificial intelligence and automation. Um, and can be leveraged across government agencies, right? So that's an area where um, the, the silos of agencies and, and the difficulty of, of outdated processes that haven't been modernized get in the way of leveraging technology to help government agencies do more with less. So, um, you, you know, that, that's one example, I guess. I was gonna add, just, I think this is a great example of the way we think about things in the past because we, we do often just go straight to the topic of shared services versus what Scott just said as the outcome, do, do more with less. So the question isn't, oh, what should we, you know, what's the, the, what should we do with shared services? How do, we get, how do we do more with less? You say, oh, well, wait a second, how do we share data across multiple organizations? oh, wait a second, it sits in different applications, and those applications sit with different providers, so we need an open platform. Yeah, we do. Why do we need an open platform? Because I just said it, we needed to work together. Okay, and if we can get them to work together, then we can get the outcome that Scott just talked about. But to get them to work together, can we contract in the same way that we've contracted? Can we budget in the same way that we've budgeted? No. Nah. And so I, I think it really does get to this thought of, Shared services is, if we focus just on that versus the outcome, we're gonna sit there and talk about it like we've been talking about it. We have to look at it from a different perspective. So Jim, I'm, I've heard you're working on a paper. Um, and um, 
is comprised of a, you know, talking to and convening CIOs, former CIOs, and things of that, of of of, of that nature. Um, I know you're not ready to release that totally yet, but just because um, one of the things I just am mindful of is we're talking, right? We're very much, you know, this is what we do for a living, right? On the corporate piece, you know, we 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 want to do business with the government. We 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 want it to be efficient. We want it to be able to have the latest and greatest technology to uh, make a difference for this this country, but for, uh, for for the government, for the for the for the public sector. Are our views different from some of the the others who have like lived and breathed this? From your perspective, the one big difference gets back to security, and I've heard this from senior officials at the White House who shall remain nameless, but they're okay. saying, and there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect because, you know, one of them said to me, you know, when you buy a car, you don't do a separate contract for seatbelts and airbags. Yeah. Right? And I know who that is. They, they've said it to us too. <laughs> <laughs> they shall remain nameless. And, and, no, nameless, I agree. <laughs> but, and then when you talk to the companies, they say, you know, agencies go for the lowest price and they don't want to pay that extra dollar for some of the security services. So that's, that's one that's come up repeatedly is no, that, that's, uh, that's how a, do you change that? That's a great example and then that gets into something depending on the size of your company, you, you have some other issues called competition um, mm -hmm. um, aspects and just gets complicated, which is part of the problem with some of the procurement and some of the uh, some of these mm -hmm. different topics is, 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 is there's so many different things that well, are part of it. But that's back a to good JWCC, point. JWCC, I'm, I'm a civilian person. I'm not a DOD person, so I'm not an expert on JWCC. But just from a contracting perspective, you know, in my opinion, they got the model right. It took a while, yeah. but that type of model, really, you're you're you know you're putting down a, a you know a deposit on the car, you're not buying the whole car, but you've got access to the whole dealership's lot, right? And and so, you know, based on uh, the requirements that you have, you can um, foster competition on that lot for the best price, the best performance, to deliver sure. the best solution um, needed for um, the end user. And, and I think that model is, you know, is improving in the federal market. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we still have a long way to go. Um, and a lot of the, you know, the requirements are, are still, and process are still onerous, but I think JWCC is, is a model that you should be replicated, um, you know, throughout the market. The JWCC model is the car. I want to buy the car. Right. That's, that's exactly it. And it, it, what we haven't enabled yet is a car manufacturer to act in the way that the car manufacturers do now. You buy the car and you're expected to have seat belts and airbags and you're expected to meet the, 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 mm -hmm. the governance that's there. And it's Schumer, yes, sir, Senator Schumer talked about a, a governance framework for, for AI. Right. Well, we should assume that's going to be there when we're ready to go forward. But you put that in place by having uh, products and capabilities, technology, and then also a convener that's going to pull that get together to orchestrate it. So there should be a services capability that, that meets together with that, and that That's should right. be mirrored on the government side. And this is, the, this is the culture change for dynamic teams that can work together in a services-like engagement, and I should say services in design, for my design-minded people. That means that we're gonna start with the end state in mind at the beginning. So, so JWCC is a nice model, but it's not executing in your with your car analogy just yet. Uh, if I can add something on that, uh, and that's, we, we haven't talked about it, it's, we're almost an hour in, and that's workforce. Uh, I know yeah. that's one of the buzzword bingo words here, but uh, the, the, when we were discussing the velocity of the contract, one of the things that um, I think a lot about is how do we make sure that the entirety of the cross-functional team that is associated with delivering a solution has the requisite training on cloud, like not just what it is, but the, the different aspects, um, as well as the implementation that will enable the successful delivery of the mission outcome. And um, I, I think about this a lot because, you know, the, the, in government right now, there's certain job categories that they're eligible for extra cyber pay, but contracting officers aren't part of that 
uh, you know, they're not part of that uh, job category. They're, they're in a different job family. They don't, uh, that doesn't apply to them. And I, I think about that a lot because I think about those folks and like the contracting officers, representatives, the cores, the COTARs on a contract. Those folks are essential to getting some of that mission outcome and getting the velocity, whether it's a task order or it's, you know, um, additional call orders on an existing uh, BPA. Uh, whatever the case may be, a lot of those folks are integrated, integral members of an integrated project team but are not necessarily held to the same, whether it's uh, training or security or what have you standard. And I think one of the things I'd love to see, I know we're not in the forward looking projection part yet, but I think I'd love to see a holistic approach to sort of workforce training on a lot of these topics, whether it's the best practices in AI ML or, or cloud or cloud security or cloud adoption um, for every member of a team that is associated with delivering results. I love, I love that you brought up workforce because one of the interesting things happening right now a former colleague of mine who's kind of a marketing genius, uh, Chris Lockhead, posted on LinkedIn about a year ago about digital natives. So the current Gen Z uh, is the first group of humans that are truly digital natives, meaning I'm, I'm Gen X, uh, had some electronics when I was younger, but um, you know I wasn't constantly online, constantly using apps. They use apps across services and platforms, and they just expect their digital experience to work. And so that's what's coming in the future, right? And so that whole customer experience executive order um, is really important because it builds trust in government. And if you can't access the services uh, in the way that you know you expect to access them if you're using Hulu or, 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 or something, right? Then, then your trust in government erodes. So thinking about not only the workforce aspect of that, but um, how, how citizens will consume services in the future is really important. And so that's kind of another looming thing um, that becomes an imperative, you know, in addition to national security, obviously, uh, for, for dealing with it. But then how do you, how do you uh, recruit and train those people into the workforce, right? If, if you're hiring somebody out of college right now and you tell them they gotta go learn COBOL, they're gonna be like, uh, what is that? So um, I think it's really important and- that, that was an insider joke if you didn't know. <laughs> if, people probably don't even know what I'm talking about. They'll be in the cluster. Like, <laughs> you have Netflix, Hulu, well, what about Prime? Yeah, yeah, Prime, Prime all of them. I was throwing you one. We love it, we love it. Yeah. Much love, love to hear it. <laughs> um, but I think there are, you know, the, the part of the challenge is you've got some innovative dif disruptors that are working in government agencies right now. I know a lot of people who um, are innovative disruptors that work for civilian or, or, or DOD or, or, or whatever. Um, but, you know, frankly, uh, a lot of times those people get sort of uh, covered by the bureaucracy just to be really transparent. And so I think a lot of it gets back to process, leadership, culture change, um, and making um, you know, some of those innovative disruptor voices heard in the process. So um, I'm glad you brought that up. That's a really good point. And we, um, we to close out one of the topics, uh, when this administration came in, they were immediately confronted by a whole set of major cyber issues. Solar Winds is in some ways the presidential one and the May uh, executive order that came out of Solar Winds focused on using acquisition authorities to drive better cybersecurity. My impression is, I don't know what you guys are hearing, is there will be something similar when it comes to cloud and to workforce. Work, cloud is a good answer to workforce, but the big attention to cloud security now in the White House and thinking about how to use maybe mandatory requirements for agencies when it comes to acquisitions to drive better security. So, uh, Here's what I would just say as we're looking to wrap up. Um, We've talked about culture, we've talked about uh, processes, processes and, and um, uh, innovation, modernization, all the different things. I guess I would just, um, I'll take on a little bit of this question as well, I would just con conclude with, the government is, is no question, um, there's a real commitment on the technology front. I am uh, convinced and believe that, that they, they, they want to maximize the utilization of technology um, and uh, in a responsible way, in a way that's efficient. Um, and some of it, uh, I think this administration has, I think other administrations have, I, you know, have, have embraced it. Um, but it does, there's a lot of different partners. There's, you know, we didn't get to one of the things that you raised to 
you know, con uh, the congressional side and, and different things. I, I am a glass half full that, you know, uh, the government is, you know, continues to pick up its pace and, and, and trying to come up with the right solutions to address some things that uh, are, are, are very challenging. And what I would say that where I see it and people are digging in and they're going to realize there's a cloud component to it, which there very much is, you know, it's a supercomputer coupled with a large language model and that's generative AI uh, uh, aspect. I'm oversimplifying it, but that, that really uh, captures it and there's a cloud component to that. I've never seen so much interest in trying to understand this technology that actually is an opportunity to talk about cloud and what you need to do for the cloud to be able to bring AI to life. I mean, I'm a scheduler now and I run a government affairs shop of just like, okay, we gotta go talk to Senator so-and-so today because they want a private tutorial on AI. And there's a cloud component. And I just think that that's a, actually an opportunity to talk about the role of cloud and, what it, and, and, and how it fits in to, to, to AI, and I'm excited about the interest from so many members, and that's, that's just not at the federal level. That's like state, local, international. Let's do a speed dating round and get through these four questions really quick, because we are running a little over time. So short answers, maybe just one person. Sometimes agencies can get overwhelmed by the perception that the move to the cloud happens all at once. What advice would you give them about transition? I, I can do a quick one, Good. really fast. Uh, Scott already mentioned cloud centers of excellence. Start small and iterate, do proofs of concept, dip your toe in the water, use an existing FedRAMP solution so that you're not reinventing the wheel, you're not starting from scratch. Try a thing, see if it works, agile, open, uh, 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 human-centered design in light of uh, uh, you know, all the good human, um, customer experience best practices from the executive order. Try it, see if, see if it's a good fit, and then iterate. Speaking of FedRAMP, with Love ZTA that. and software bill of materials moving forward, how can government reduce the burden of COTS certification on SMEs struggling with the FedRAMP cost structure? COTS, of course, is commercial off the shelf, and SME is small and medium enterprises. So what would you say? Anyone want to touch that one? Apparently not. Go ahead. That's a, that's a long answer. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah, I, know. I, know. I tried to get the long ones out so, of the way first. But. Um, I, I, I've got Go a, a bit of an answer, which is that um, we, as sort of uh, bottom layers of the cloud tech stack, uh, we have a shared responsibility model where we secure the cloud itself, and what's in it is the responsibility of entities that use uh, items further up the stack. And in the case of a small and medium-sized application, well, I think what we would all say is, is develop in the cloud natively, inherit our controls, inherit our FedRAMP packages at the lower end, and then there's less re-architecting to do for just the software application. And that's, I think that's the, the best short answer is one that's back to looking at where, where the outcome is, and we have luxury, and we talk about what we are from the bottom to the top of the stack and the services. I mean, that's a unique part about IBM. And when we look at it, even when it's all of, of our capability, if you start, if you, oh, I have Z, but I also have Red Hat, and I'm going to add some, some, some more of your, your, your capability uh, on the top with your multiple applications. How do I do that? Well, do it with design, understand the outcome, and be willing to take some of the commercial off-the-shelf capability from other players, and this is the ecosystem necessity to solve the complex problems and do it on an open platform so all of us can be engaged. Great, two more questions, one for Fred, but this one, this is not yours for you. You can do it if you want. Um, <laughs> for government agencies that are open to cloud but feel captive to legacy IT systems um, in their environment, and I can think of a couple, uh, what should they do? You know, the transit, managing the transition process is harder than it looks, I think, and there is risk. I think I already touched on it with proofs of concept, rapid prototyping. I mean, that's what the cloud is really good at, spinning yeah. things up, um, you know, testing things out, and then spinning things down, right? You, you don't have to make a huge server investment to try something. Um, you just spin up a VM and, and, and test it out, right? So I think that, that mindset of getting into rapid prototyping is, is really important. Um, and again, it does kind of get back to 
what I talked about at the very beginning, which is a strong center of excellence. It's kind of the metamorphosis of the old PMO into uh, this, this cloud center of excellence that looks at a portfolio of things, prioritizes them, and, and helps enable those rapid prototypes to figure out which investments to make and which uh, workloads are going to have the most impact, right? And so it, you know, it can be overwhelming. Um, and, you know, we used to call it uh, analysis paralysis, right? Like you have to break out of that analysis paralysis and just do something. And the cloud really enables that more than any other sort of computing model in, in history, right? So take advantage of that and, and run rapid prototypes and POCs. Last question. Does and everybody love Azure? Is that it? Yeah, that was it. Yes. Oh, yeah. yes. Okay. Okay, that was the second last question. The last question is, what does Congress need to do? Because in this city, Congress often has the final say. Does Congress need to do anything? What needs to change? What would you have Congress do? Oh, um, wow. That, that, Other that, than give more money. Yeah. No, no, actually, I wasn't going to say give more money. Oh. Uh, um, I could, I, could, I could use the whole hour um, to, to, to talk about that. I, I, I think that the Congress still, um, it, it has the ability to do this, it has the wherewithal, it definitely has the authority and power, but just, you know, they got to continue to dig in and learn and be willing to be um, open to change. And, you know, uh, sometimes that mindset is so hard to break. Uh, that, you know, kind of done this, we need to do it iterative, you know, we're only going to, you know, we'll, we'll try this for a moment and, and that aspect, but just really open up to just say, hey, we might need to do some major changes and, uh, uh, and not just tweaks um, mm -hmm. um, um, there, and um, which also means you got to work across different uh, committees. Mm -hmm. Uh, 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 aspect and, and say, okay, let's, let, let's, let's take this on. And, uh, and I also think it's important that it needs to be bipartisan yeah. um, um, as well. It's, it's, the it's there. It's, That's the a, it's there. And I actually believe this AI moment as they think about, you know, uh, legislation uh, um, and guardrails, there, there could be some things that just to be think about, uh, you know, I always look for opportunities to say, okay, this is great. You need to figure out these guardrails on this. But boy, you have an opportunity to uh, focus on this, and they actually are important to go together. Well, Being proactive, I, I think I'll jump in. I'd say be proactive, not reactive. And that requires yeah. bipartisanship. That yeah. requires a lot of things that, that yeah. Fred's mentioned. And being proactive, knowing that uh, yesterday's challenge, and we're still living out of, was, was a pandemic. And we had to work, think, act differently. And now we're in the, the, the Gen AI moment, as Fred just mentioned. So that's the next. There's always going to be a next. And, it, and if we're exactly reactive, right. we're on our back foot. How do we have to be proactive? You, yeah. you, you know, I, um, I'm going to AI, but it's, it's still a, a mindset. Uh, uh, What's the LDP uh, in, uh, in Japan, right? Japan won. Liberal Democratic, Democratic Party. Party. Yeah. Liberal Democratic Party is. Uh, they want Japan to embrace AI. And there was a white paper done. And I looked at this white paper, and it's just like a great example of, you know, the party putting together a roadmap of what you have to do. And they thought through everything, what they're going to have to do on data centers, and what they're going to have to do on data, and what they're going to have to uh, uh, um, do on just, uh, you know, getting adoption, right? And where they want to go first. And it's like this roadmap. I'm just like, oh, my gosh. If they go execute on this, they will be the leaders Mm. on AI, you know, um, and it had all the right aspects and, and it was government driven and, you know, and then they're going to go get buy-in um, on, on the private. It was, it's not the private sector, just, just that aspect. And, and I just kind of feel like you have all these technology companies here in the U.S. that are leaders, each one that are on this panel. I mean, they, these are great companies uh, um, and there could be more and do a whole bunch of things and actually from a leadership perspective, if they, if they get it right and lead by example on, here's how you do it on the processes and, and this government can have the most modern, uh, transformative and you know, great technology that makes a difference for people who uh, work in government, interact with government and, and need the help of government. Well, that was the initial thought behind this project is let's, because 
these are competitors, but they also work together. And we wanted to get them all on the same stage and say, it would be in the benefit of the citizens, it would be in the benefit of security, it would be in the benefit of the, to the benefit of the economy and the cost of government if we could accelerate the move to the cloud. So with that, please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.